let me apologize uh, for the uh, last minute time change, which I think uh, cost us uh, some audience. Uh, the First Lady needed the room for an event, and uh, what the President and First Lady need uh, has a certain priority around here for reasons uh, that we all understand. So we did, um, we did have to move it, and sorry for the inconvenience, but thanks uh, to those of you who were able uh, to make it nonetheless. We really, uh, really do uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, before I, I really get going, uh, I want to uh, recognize a, a couple of folks who are very important in our agricultural uh, research establishment. Uh, Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy, the director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is here down in the first, uh, second row. And uh, Dr. Ann Bartuska, who is the deputy undersecretary uh, of agriculture for uh, research, education, and economics. Uh, her boss, the undersecretary for all of those things, Dr. Kathy Wotecki, will be introduced and heard from uh, later, and her bio is in the materials that people got uh, coming in. And we are uh, sorry to be missing uh, Deputy Secretary Kathleen Merrigan, but we lost her in the, in the switch. Uh, but let me, uh, on behalf of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, affectionately known as PCAS, which I have the honor of co-chairing, uh, welcome all of you to this uh, release of PCAS's latest report, our report on enhancing uh, U.S. agricultural preparedness. Uh, separately and um, in my capacity as the President's Science and Technology Advisor, but more importantly on behalf of the President, I really want to thank uh, PCAST and in particular the members of the PCAST Working Group on Agricultural Preparedness, which did uh, so much uh, good work on this report. I think it's really uh, an outstanding job. Of course, you might think I have to say that, but this is really uh, an, outstanding, uh, an outstanding job. And I think you'll agree on reading it, as I hope everyone will, every page, every word. Uh, it brings into focus a number of issues that, while widely underappreciated in the larger science and technology community, are in fact extremely important, uh, not only for uh, our agricultural research enterprise, but for our uh, research enterprise and our economy uh, more broadly. Uh, I say underappreciated because, unlike the situation uh, a couple of generations ago, most people in the country today, and I think I'm afraid to say most scientists and engineers, are not especially attuned to agricultural issues and perhaps are even less attuned to the enormous importance that research and development in the agricultural sciences play in underpinning our continuing agricultural productivity and, in a very real sense, our security and our prosperity. But I think it only takes a few moments of contemplation and, in a sense, looking at the data, which I always recommend, uh, to recognize how essential the country's agricultural enterprise is. Uh, the economic dimension is a big part of that appreciation, of course. Uh, as the PCAST report notes, exports of agricultural products produced a $34 billion trade surplus in 2010, a $37 billion trade surplus in 2011. And while we're no longer primarily a nation of farmers, as we once were, the agricultural sector is still responsible for one in 12 American jobs. But beyond its economic impact, the U.S. agricultural sector provides a foundation for world food stability and security, supplying most of the food aid to developing nations around the world. And of course, there can be no political stability without food security. At the foundation of this remarkable agricultural enterprise is a world of research and development that, in this country at least, dates back uh, to our founding fathers. Our founding fathers in this country were deeply committed to agricultural science. And over the decades and centuries, the R&D component of our agricultural enterprise has made the U.S. farmer among the most efficient in the world. Uh, since the 1930s, uh, just to give a few examples, yields of staple crops such as soybeans have more than tripled, corn yields have increased fivefold, and these successes stem directly from the investments we made in basic and applied plant, animal, and agricultural research across the federal agencies, and of course the translation and implementation of that research by land-grant universities and by the private sector. I'm going to leave it to my uh, colleagues from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and to study co-leader Dr. Dan Schrag of PCAS to go into the details with you, but there's one take-home message that I want to leave you with from this report, 
And that message is really how important it is that this remarkable history of improvements in agriculture through research and development must continue going forward. Uh, we cannot rest on our laurels. As the report documents, we face some stiff challenges in the decades ahead to our agricultural system. Uh, I won't talk about those, I'll let others, but uh, I'll simply say that happily they are not insurmountable challenges. And I want to point out one very important thing in particular, especially in these times, which is that PCAST doesn't simply look to Congress and say, provide more money, that's important. Uh, we do call for more financial support in some areas, but the report also calls for important structural changes in how the Department of Agriculture and the federal government support agricultural research. And along with a rebalancing of the agricultural research portfolio, this can go a long way toward ensuring that America continues to be the world leader in agricultural production and preparedness for many decades to come. So I commend uh, to all of you uh, what I think is a very rational and uh, implementable approach to advancing U.S. agricultural productivity, stability, sustainability, and more. Uh, as you can see from your agendas, at this point I was supposed to introduce uh, Deputy Secretary Kathleen Merrigan, but I can't because uh, she's, alas, not here. Uh, but I'm, at this point, going to pass the baton to PCAS own uh, Dan Schrag. Uh, Dan is a professor in the uh, Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences and in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard, and he is the director of the Harvard Center for the Environment, as well as a, a very productive member of PCAST and the co-leader of this study. And he will be followed by USDA Chief Scientist and Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, uh, Dr. Kathy Wotecki, who may say a little bit about what Kathleen Merrigan would have said, as well as offering her own, uh, her own thoughts on this report. So at this point, Dan, it is all yours. Thanks to John Holder, and I've got to say, uh, I don't know how previous uh, PCASTs worked, but this PCAST is a highly collaborative, um, engaged group of individuals, and, and I thank John Holdren for his, his leadership, really, in stewarding this report all the way through to the finish. Um, he has uh, really supported this effort from the beginning, and, and uh, it's a very important reason of why we're here today. Uh, I want to start out just thanking somebody who was also not here. Unfortunately, this was scheduled when my uh, co-chair of this working group, Barbara Shaw, couldn't be here. As many of you know, Barbara is a, a plant biologist at Washington University in St. Louis, um, the vice president of the National Academy of Sciences, and an incredibly forceful and articulate spokesperson within PCAST championing this report from the very beginning. And so really, um, uh, she has been my, my partner and guide throughout this process. And uh, I'm really sorry she's not here, but we really have to acknowledge it because this, this report really started from her and is really her vision. And we, he, we see her wisdom throughout this report. So, so, so thank you to Barbara. Um, there were two other PCAST members who contributed substantially to the working group, Rosina Bierbaum and Mark Gorenberg. Um, they also, their wisdom was, was very influential in this, in getting us to this study. And I want to uh, make clear to all of you that this was a highly collaborative group um, with uh, a working group of people from, both from academia, from government service, and from, uh, from industry. And uh, I just want to quickly name the working group, Sharon Clay, Jeff Dangle, David Fishoff, Molly John, Don Latham, Frank Mitlunner. Tom Sinclair, who's with us today, and, uh, and Chris Somerville. Um, in addition, the working group worked with, through a series of workshops, um, people from across the agricultural sector, from industry, from government, from you know, former leadership of the Department of Agriculture, um, and of course, um, academics as well. And uh, uh, all of those, those uh, all of that input was extremely important. Finally, um, two PCAST staff members, uh, Amber Hartman-Schultz and uh, uh, Mary Maxson were both incredibly um, important in making this happen, not just logistically, but actually in the, in the recommendations and structure of the report. They were really partners in all of this. So thank you to Mary and Amber. You guys are heroes. So, so um, 
one final thank you really is to uh, uh, the leadership of the USDA. This was a collaborative report, not in the sense that they actually wrote it or told us what to say, but ultimately um, PCAS report to the president um, has to be acted on by the Department of Agriculture to a large extent. And really the wisdom and advice and engagement of Undersecretary Watecki, who we'll hear from for a minute, also Roger Beachy, and then later on more recently Sunny Ramaswamy, was absolutely critical in actually getting the result that, that we have, which we think is both um, uh, important but also actionable and, and we hope will be effective. And so thank you to both of you, but we'll hear from Kathy in a second. Um, we also benefited from, from data, from science and technology. PCAST is a group of scientists uh, and technologists, and so as a result, the Economic Research Service and the Science and Technology uh, Policy Institute, as well as NSF, provided data for this report that was critical to reaching the conclusions that we did, so we thank their support as well. Okay, so let's do a very brief overview of this report. I'm not going to spend a long time on it. You have um, the executive summary. Hopefully, many of you have actually read the report by now. I can tell you as somebody who slaved over every sentence in the report <laughs> that it's actually incredibly well written. Um, it actually makes wonderful Christmas gifts. So you might think about that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful uh, uh, report. But um, uh, in all seriousness, um, I think it's important for me to just briefly give you a sense of, of how we got to where this report ended up. Um, we really started asking, what are the challenges? What are the issues in front of us that um, are a priority for agriculture in the decades ahead? Um, we were all aware of how important agriculture um, has been in this country's history. It was, to me, a little uh, ironic that we were, we were doing this um, report in the 150th year after the Morrill Act and, and how important that is, not just to agriculture and the research development of the United States, but also to the democratization of, of education in the United States. Really, it was the land-grant institutions that um, gave access to education um, and uh, all that comes with that um, across the nation um, to parts of the nation that, that really didn't have access before. So this was an incredible, important part of our history. And so in thinking about its role going forward, this was a very important time. And as um, John Holdren mentioned, agriculture is incredibly important to our economy. It's incredibly important to our jobs in our economy, um, and also to the world in terms of food security and stability. Um, what's interesting to us is that, that uh, agriculture perhaps has become a victim of its own success. It has been, the improvements in agriculture and yield have been so phenomenal that actually uh, there has been an assumption almost that, that uh, this state could continue, that essentially uh, with actually no more investment in research that uh, agriculture would continue to flourish. And in some ways that's actually happened partly because of the investment of the private sector. So the private sector's investment in agricultural research is substantial and very healthy and very vibrant. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, over the last three decades, federal funding for agricultural research has been roughly flat. This is at a time when science budgets in other areas of science around the country have grown by a huge amount. So, so this is an interesting backdrop for this. And really, one of the immediate questions in front of us was the balance between private and public and, and the overlap between private and public funding for research. What was clear to us after discussions with people from across the spectrum in the agricultural research community was that actually there were private and public sector needs that were actually quite different. That there were a number of emerging challenges for agriculture that required a research investment that were really in the public domain, that the private sector was not going to do on its own. And that in fact there were some important areas that, that just either required partnership with the private sector or really required a sole public investment. And that was something that, that came out very clearly. I can talk about briefly about what some of these challenges are. Clearly managing new pests and pathogens, invasive plants and other organisms, incredibly important for the future. Um, we have sort of gotten lulled into a sense of security by some of the advances, but in fact things like uh, uh, wheat rust and other things are, are emerging once again as, as a danger to our agricultural system and, and it's very important to, to continue efforts on that. Um, water, uh, obviously water in all of its components, both quantity and quality, um, 
this summer's drought and really the summer before in Texas um, are extreme examples of this, but uh, this is going to be a continuing challenge um, going forward, and so we have to think again about uh, water efficiency and uh, uh, all of that goes along with water use and its relationship to um, plants, animals, and um, the entire agricultural uh, activity. Um, we also uh, identify the, the environmental footprint of agriculture, um, things from greenhouse gases to also to fertilizer runoff and pollution in streams and, and waterways, soil quality. Um, again, a lot of this is agricultural practice, um, a variety of, of, of good science and engineering that is involved, and this is an important area of investment as well. Um, climate change, I think more and more the climate science community, and I'm a member of that uh, community, recognizes that's, that extreme events and heat waves are more and more connected to the rise in greenhouse gases that we're um, uh, continuing. Uh, and this will also affect pests and pathogens, although really the, the impact of climate change on agriculture and pests is sort of a, a, a new field in some ways. It's, it's really the, the, the most, some of the most important work is less than a decade old. And so there's a lot of, of new people coming into this field, and it's a, a discovering a lot of room. For example, um, recently there was just a, a paper that's come out on the role of adaptation and how farmers historically have adapted to the change that we've already experienced. Really one of the first studies that has analyzed this carefully, and that's kind of amazing. There's a lot more good work that needs to be done. Um, at the same time we're dealing with climate change, there's the challenge of bioenergy. And really bioenergy is just one component of a broader um, bioeconomy that we've talked about. And so this is an additional demand for agriculture at a time when agriculture is al already um, uh, asked to do quite a lot. And uh, we can anticipate partly in response to climate concerns, but also in response to other concerns about security and uh, other energy issues that w we will expect greater demands of, on, on the agricultural community for producing um, fuel uh, as well. And that's going to be a, a major challenge. And finally, the broader challenge of global food security. The truth is we feed the world. We are the major supplier of, of food aid in the world, and uh, we have to maintain that ability partly for, uh, for our own national security because stability in other parts of the world actually matters to us. So I think uh, we can step back and say each of these challenges by themselves is actually a difficult one. Each of them involves multiple disciplines, each of them involves a variety of complex basic science and applied science issues. Um, and they're not going to be solved. We're not going to come up with you know, solutions to any of these next year. These are going to be continuing challenges. Many of them the agricultural community has worked on for a long time. Some of them are emerging in the agricultural community. But this is going to be a sustained effort over many decades. And that's really the pattern that we have to step, step up. But the magnitude of these problems really means that we need to focus the attention on this area. So in the report, we look at the research enterprise and ask the question, are we really prepared for this? Um, I don't want to go through all of the details of our findings, but let me just say very simply, um, really, from these challenges, we conclude that, in fact, we are not prepared to meet all of these in the current system. There are many things of the, in the current agricultural research system that we should be very proud of, but one of the challenges is that as the funding has remained flat, as the um, uh, private sector has um, invested uh, so much effort, there's currently a lot of overlap, a lot of overlap between the private research and, and publicly funded research. Now, some of that overlap is a good thing. Clearly, you don't want you know, complete uh, uh, separation of the activities. There's a training important component, and there's also a lot of knowledge transfer between the two. But, uh, our working group felt that the, the overlap was a little bit too much and that there were actually were some of these challenges that weren't getting enough attention from the public funding that were clearly in the public domain and that the private sector wasn't going to do enough. Um, so there's a, an opportunity for rebalancing here. The second important point is that uh, the allocation of research support is currently dominated by non-competitive processes. And in every other sector of, of, of scientific uh, research, um, uh, they tend to have a much higher fraction of competitive awards, and as a result, there was a PCAST concern that, that this might actually hinder innovation. So PCAST recognizes the, um, the incredible importance of the agricultural research enterprise to the country. 
So we recommend actually a substantial new investment in agricultural research. Substantial new investment that you can think of as really a reinvigoration of um, agricultural research in all areas, both in research, in training of the workforce, in education, um, and also in the infrastructure that's required to get it done. Um, we uh, essentially um, go through a variety of, of details in this. We recommend a basic research component really funded through the National Science Foundation. NSF plays an incredibly important role in basic science research, and in some ways they have, uh, 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 for, for a variety of reasons, their attention to basic research in support of agriculture has waned a little bit. We want to invigorate that and uh, uh, reestablish that, so we recommend a new allocation of money for that effort. Um, we also recommend substantial additional competitive funding to grow the competitive programs within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, we also have some important areas where we felt that uh, actually synergy between the private sector and the public sector was incredibly important. And we looked at the Department of Energy and they were very successful hubs and energy frontier research centers and also uh, some of the efforts on biofuels. The U.S. the, the, the uh, DOE uh, centers, but also the BP center at, at Berkeley, that uh, is a public-private partnership with a substantial focus of funding on a on a challenge, and we thought that this actually might be an incredibly important mechanism for the USDA as well to actually set up a series of um, public-private partnerships around some of these grand challenges, letting the different groups actually define what the scope of that challenge was, but bringing partners from from the Agricultural Research Service, from academia, and from the private sector together in a consortia that, in, in, in a series of consortia that would actually work on a variety of these challenges. We think that is an experiment well worth doing. Um, separate from the research investments themselves, one of the recurring themes that we heard both from academia and from industry was the need for training new students. Agriculture used to attract the best and the brightest, and there's a concern that the students coming in to graduate programs, there are still wonderful students across this country, but that we were worried that we were not necessarily drawing and attracting the very best students from the sciences. Agricultural, agriculture, the, these challenges of agriculture are so exciting, they're so important scientifically that we should be attracting, we should be competing with biochemistry, with molecular biology, with, with earth sciences, with, with engineering, with any, any other science program in the country. And so PCAST recommends an investment in expanding and broadening the fellowship program um, at the USDA. Other uh, science agencies, NSF, NIH, and others, NASA, et cetera, have very vibrant graduate and postdoc fellowship programs that attract, that really help the community attract the very best and the brightest. We feel a, an investment in um, uh, graduate fellowships and postdoctoral fellowships will really, in some ways, create this, uh, this innovation ecosystem and, and, inc and increase the sort of level of enthusiasm and energy within the agricultural field. Um, and then finally, in addition to a variety of other things I'm, I'm not going to mention here for lack of time, we, we recognize that infrastructure is a big challenge. One of the problems is that, you know, the original vision for agriculture was a distributed system where there was lots and lots of, of, of institutions doing agricultural research at a very local scale. The problem is that as science has advanced, we have large facilities that can't be duplicated at every single institution. We just can't afford that kind of level of investment. So there needs to be a sort of overall plan for investment in infrastructure. We need a new investment and new money in infrastructure, but we have to be competitive about it so that we actually fund key institutions to provide centers and then give access to other institutions to those facilities. And I think uh, Under Secretary Watecki has already uh, uh, worked towards this, but, but this is something that clearly needs more attention as well. So with that, um, uh, we'll have time later on to ask specific, ask specific questions, and we'll have time for the panel as well. But um, let's uh, move on and, and hear from Undersecretary Watecki and get her thoughts, and then we'll move on to the panel. So, so let me just briefly introduce Kathy. Um, she's, as, you, as John said, the Chief Scientist at the USDA and the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics. She oversees the USDA R&D components and institutes, including NEFA and the Agricultural Research Service, the Economic Research Service, and the National Agriculture Statistics Service. She has, over the years, worn many hats, from industry to government and academia, and I can just tell you that working with her has been just a, a joy and a privilege because uh, 
she really has uh, laid out some of the challenges, but also given us the, the space to really um, uh, uh, come to these conclusions, uh, bringing the community along. And so I really appreciate her efforts on this. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Schrag, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, both Secretary Vilsack and uh, Deputy Secretary Merrigan have had uh, an enormous interest in this project right from the beginning when uh, the first uh, question arose, you know, how well prepared are we to meet these agricultural challenges and, and really what is the role of our science agencies in, in addressing these challenges? And both of them wanted to be here this afternoon. Um, we thought we were going to have uh, Deputy Secretary Merrigan provide uh, her view and, and comments on the report, its, its findings, and its recommendations. But sadly, with the uh, last minute time change, she wasn't able to be here. Uh, we do have with us, though, um, some additional very important people from the department that I wanted to recognize. Uh, in addition to Dr. Ramaswamy, the director of our extramural program, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, we also have present Dr. Ed Nippling, who is the administrator of the Agricultural Research Service, and Dr. Cynthia Clark, the administrator of the National Agricultural Statistics Service, and we have several uh, members of the Economic Research Service who uh, played an important role, as Dr. Schrag said, in, in providing some analysis and, and data in, in response to uh, the needs of, of the committee and uh, that, uh, that put together this report. Dr. Mary Bowman, the uh, administrator of ERS, has been in Rome this week at a very important conference convened by the United Nations. Uh, that's uh, examining how do we improve worldwide um, our agricultural statistics. And Dr. Clark has also, with Dr. Bowman, been playing very much a leadership role in these UN activities to improve agricultural statistics worldwide. Um, we look at these activities of ERS and NAS as being an essential part of our research infrastructure as, as well. So uh, we really regret the change in timing. We're glad that everybody's been able to join us in person or uh, by video. And uh, the fact that this distinguished and diverse group of scientists in the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology has focused its time and efforts on examining the future of agricultural research and our nation's preparedness to meet the food, fiber, and bioenergy needs of the next decades is very heartening to us who, who look at agriculture as being a key part of our nation's critical infrastructure and economy. In, in fact, if you look back over the 150 years that we've had a Department of Agriculture, um, science has been part of it from the very beginning. And that work has enabled uh, America's food security, uh, as Dr. Schrag has already pointed out. And it's also laid the groundwork for a lot of breakthroughs in plant and animal physiology, biochemistry, genetics, human nutrition, food science, food safety, as well in fields that are further afield. Um, chemistry, medicine, environmental science, and agriculture actually was the birthplace of the whole field of statistics to begin with. Uh, so in addition, um, the Department of Agriculture is also the place where um, other federal agencies were born. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration grew out of programs in, in the Department of Agriculture, as did parts of the Environmental Protection Agency. But uh, too often, we failed to tell our own story. So we thank you very much, PCAST, for uh, helping us uh, to do that. I specifically want to thank Dr. Holdren, uh, the co-chairs of this study. Uh, you've heard from Dr. Schrag, um, also Dr. Barbara Shaw, uh, for their leadership, and specifically also to Dr. Amber Hartman Schultz of the PCAST staff for the work, Amber, that you've done in coordinating the report and also in helping to get us all here today, this afternoon. Uh, it seems fortuitous to me that this report is the 
first to be issued after the report that PCAST issued last Friday. Uh, last week's study was of the future of the U.S. research enterprise broadly writ. And that report uh, reaffirmed President Obama's goal that U.S. total R&D expenditures reach a level of about 3% of our gross domestic product. So uh, our competitiveness definitely depends on that. And I was kind of intrigued by that number. So I asked the Economic Research Service to give me an estimate of the expenditures on public and private agricultural research as a percentage of agriculture GDP. And they tell me that that number is 1.9%. So both public and private sectors have a ways to go to meet this goal for agriculture if you look at the 3% goal as, as applying across different sectors of the economy. And I think it also underscores your overall recommendation that the U.S. increase its investment in agricultural research. The recommendations that PCAS makes in the report that it's releasing today uh, provide an excellent opportunity to, to launch some important initiatives, even in the midst of what is a somewhat bleak outlook with respect to appropriations. As it points out, the public investment in agricultural research should focus around the grand challenges posed by emerging threats such as new pests and pathogens, limited water availability, impacts of agriculture on human and environmental health, and adaptation to a changing climate. By recommending increased partnerships and collaborations beyond what we're already doing, uh, we can move forward on some recommendations within our current appropriations. So work can also begin on the new innovation ecosystem that's recommended, leveraging the best from our current infrastructure. On examination of the report, I want to highlight a few of the areas in I, which I believe that we can begin working to strengthen uh, our work. Uh, the first is in the rebalancing of the portfolio. The report recommends a gradual rebalancing of the agricultural portfolio away from intramural and formula and capacity funding and toward a more competitive environment. Um, the 2008 Farm Bill that authorized our, our, our programs and, and created the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and its competitive grants program, the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, what we call AFRI, uh, laid an important foundation for this rebalancing. And I think this re recommendation actually reaffirms the budget strategy that's informed the President's uh, budget requests for AFRI over this last several years. So as we rebalance, we need to maintain also a strong intramural program to fulfill what are the necessary and uniquely governmental responsibilities, such as providing the evidence base for regulatory action, performing the sensitive research that protects our animal and plant resources, responding to accidental and deliberate contamination of our food and water supplies, preserving genetic collections and providing infrastructure for long-term fundamental agroecosystem science for agricultural statistics and also in the areas of economics. Another recommendation is to conduct a review of regulatory policy for agriculture. And while the agencies in my mission area um, are not in the regulatory realm, um, they often perform the research that regulators need for decision making. And we're ready to assist with a review of federal regulatory policy for agriculture. And we are leading for the department uh, its efforts to implement the president's memorandum on technology transfer and preparing our first annual report uh, on that effort. PCAS recommends that six multidisciplinary innovation institutes be created and, and focused on the emerging challenges. Um, we have some models that we've been experimenting with over the last couple of years in AFRI. Um, the Coordinated Agriculture Program grants uh, have pr uh, provided uh, grants to, to challenge the scientific community to build consortia aimed at solving critical problems. And, and so far, this uh, CAP approach uh, has funded some very innovative work in genetics and genomics as it relates to legumes, wheat, barley, and rice. 
uh, as well as bioenergy feedstock development, new approaches to preventing obesity in the human population, and climate mitigation. Uh, today, with uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development, we're awarding five grants totaling uh, over $5 million for research to improve the production of the common bean. And this is one of the world's most vital food crops. Uh, the projects under the President's Feed the Future initiative will address production challenges faced by smallholder producers. This year, the Agricultural Research Service launched uh, what we're calling Long-Term Agroecosystem Research Network, or LTAR, uh, that links 10 of the intramural laboratories and 60 universities on a regional basis to focus on water, soil, and other environmental studies important to sustainable intensification of agricultural production. And as we incorporate the concepts of One Health into our program, uh, the concept of One Health uh, unifies um, plant, animal, and human health and recognizes that their interests are, are really inextricably linked, both here in the United States domestically as well as globally. So we'll be looking to the models that PCAS has pointed us to in, in the report, as well as some of these experiments we've been doing ourselves as we consider how to implement this recommendation on new centers of excellence uh, for innovation. I'm really pleased that the report pays attention to a number of very important infrastructure issues and human capital issues that are critical for our country's future. The report acknowledges the aging and increasingly obsolete infrastructure for agricultural research. And, and Congress also took notice of this this past year and asked the Agricultural Research Service to prepare a capital investment plan for its facilities across the United States. This plan was delivered to Congress earlier this year. The land-grant university system is also in much the same situation as it relates to agricultural research facilities. And there is no currently funded authority uh, for the department to competitively fund new research facilities and to renovate or replace aging infrastructure at our largest agricultural research institutions. So work on this issue has to be a priority, and we really have to be focusing on our infrastructure needs. I might just add a footnote there that um, we do have the authority for doing this, but it simply has not been funded since 1987. The one exception to that are the historically black colleges that we call the colleges of 1890, uh, for which there's a, a, about a $20 million competitive program uh, currently within the NIFA portfolio. Working to ensure a well-educated agricultural science workforce is critical uh, for the success of rural America, but also for one of our largest industries here in the United States, and that's food and agriculture. We look forward to working with the National Science Foundation to expand competitive fellowship programs that both NSF and NIFA support. We work already with NSF on, on a broad range of research topics in the genetics and genomics area, biodiversity, robotics, uh, as well as uh, uh, in the area of climate change. And I've spoken with my colleague, Dr. Subra Suresh, as has Dr. Ramaswamy, about uh, identifying further areas in which we can collaborate. Finally, the report recommends that a science advisory committee be formed to advise the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics. At USDA, we've got a lot of advisory committees, but we don't have one that does this. Um, we do have a, a, a stakeholder committee, the, the NERI board, that provides advice to the Secretary and, and to me about um, our research programs, education, economics, extension, they've even delved into the statistics programs recently. Uh, but it would be most useful to have a really cutting edge science advisory group uh, that would help us in uh, further sharpening our, our focus on, on science. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to form such a group expeditiously uh, once we get reauthorization of our programs um, in the Agriculture Reform, Food, and Jobs Act. 
And I look forward to continued collaboration with uh, members of PCAST, uh, with our colleagues and other government agencies, uh, with scientists in public and private universities and in the private sector. My thanks to all of you in PCAST for the work that you put into this report and to the many people that you consulted, because I know there were many of them. Uh, with adequate and well-considered investment, we'll continue to push the frontiers of knowledge and maintain what really has been stunning momentum for agriculture's growth. So thank you for all very much. back up here in a little while to be a participating question and answer. Wonderful. So thanks to uh, all of you for joining me here today. Let me just briefly introduce you. You have their bio, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. To my left here, Ellen Bergfeld is uh, the CEO of, of three scientific societies in agriculture, the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and the Soil Science Society of America, representing about 30,000 scientists and related professionals. Tom Sinclair, in the middle, uh, was one of our working group members um, as part of this uh, PCAS process. Uh, Tom is a crop, is a plant physiologist and agricultural scientist. He's worked in the Agricultural Research Service at the University of Florida and most recently at North Carolina State University. And unfortunately, Norm Scott, who is the chairman of the National Research Council's Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources, or, or Banner, um, couldn't be here today. He, he had a family uh, uh, issue. But on his behalf, we're very happy to have Robin shown. Thank you, Robin, for coming. Robin is the director of, the, of Banner, and she has a long history in science policy, working on a full range of issues, but very much uh, agriculture has been a big focus for her. So thank you, Robin. So, so let's actually start off with you, Robin. So, so Robin, you know, the PCAST report really benefited enormously from previous work by the NRC. And there, um, although we didn't just uh, uh, take your report um, as a starting point, uh, we actually ended up in many of the same places. And, and do you want to reflect a little bit on um, your perception, having worked on that banner report, on, on, on the recommendations here and how they resonate? Sure. Well, I didn't work on these reports because they were produced, several reports were produced um, over many decades, actually, looking at agricultural research and recommending that there be more competitive uh, research grants given. And I think uh, the reason that the um, NRC panels over the years thought that greater attention to competitive grants was important uh, was in part not because you couldn't make um, advances or innovation in other ways. After all, as you noted in your opening remarks, we've done remarkable things in agriculture with only a, a small amount of money going to competitive grants, um, but that they fulfilled sort of a, a, a balance and a portfolio for the whole approach to agricultural research. And ultimately, I think what competitive research does is um, press people for rigor and moves the scientific enterprise forward because you have to perform or you don't get another grant. You produce information that you publish. Other people can build on it. Your um, work is examined by peers. Um, I mean, obviously, there's been criticisms of, of the peer review process in, in, within the academy itself. Um, High-risk research doesn't necessarily always get funded. Multidisciplinary research is hard to review if you only have a, a review panel that's narrowly focused. Um, but I think um, in balance, it's felt that if you really want to be considered a serious scientific organization, you've got to have the rigor that competitive grants provide. That's great. And Tom, you know, in our working group discussions, you were a constant uh, uh, reminder to us of how important the training was and the training role of agriculture, how important it was to actually um, find the best students, attract them, and actually um, give them uh, a solid foundation from which to, to take this research enterprise forward in the future. The competitive grants program not just the fellowships, but also the, 
the, the, the, this rebalancing actually affects the education environment as well. Do you want to you want to comment on that? Well, let me comment first. Let me uh, say uh, I was on on this panel uh, pretty well all through the gestation, and I want to thank uh, Dan and Barbara for their uh, leadership in this effort. Uh, I was probably the uh, dirt on boots agronomist on this panel, and I was always coming up with things that uh, were kind of new to them, I think, or to new to others, and uh, fortunately, I'm glad that some of these things showed up, and I guess that's why I respect our leadership, because they I, did, didn't I got, automatically uh, discard all these things. I gotta say, d d d there's no question Tom was a uh, dirt on boots uh, agronomist. We did actually have somebody, Don Latham, who would occasionally participate in our conference calls from his tractor on the f in the farm. So, so we actually uh, had some real, real farm uh, 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 perspective as well, but yeah, great. Well, let me get to the education issue. I don't think many recognize how serious crisis we are in, in our education level. The number of crop scientists in the U.S. is now less than half of what it was 20 years ago. That is, we have that many fewer scientists doing, meeting these uh, more severe challenges. And it's worse than that because I think the number of scientists in the, pub, in the private sector hasn't decreased. So virtually all this decrease has been in the public sector. There are not that many plant scientists when you look around. And the future is really dismal in how we're going to do that. And we need this infusion of funding to bring in people that, that we can excite about the agriculture and excite them across the spectrum of disciplines in agriculture. We've got many things, many things they do, and I hope, hope we can make the spectrum pretty broad. And we need to excite uh, American uh, uh, people into this. Uh, it's pretty rare that you can go into graduate school now and find any U.S. citizens. And uh, that is not wholly bad, but it would be nice to have some homegrown scientists who, may, who understand how this economy works and how important food and agriculture is to, to the, uh, to the to the U.S. So I'm very excited about this recommendation that we really uh, uh, innovate things to support uh, education in, in, uh, in for future scientists. Thanks, Tom. And Ellen, let's turn to you. So, so you represent, as we heard, I said, a large number of agricultural scientists. What what, what is what is their um, perspective on this in terms of the grand challenges and the and the real issues they're facing, both in their laboratories and on their farms? Absolutely. I think this is, it's, the report is coming out at a very critical time. Uh, at the same time, within even the report as it's written, it indicates that there have been numerous requests for competitive funds, you know, dating back to the early 1970s, and we're not quite there yet. So it's a chronic issue. We've not kept up with funding. Uh, the investments, as Dr. Lotecki has indicated, uh, have not been made in the infrastructure. We've got a lot of individuals who are trying to do really good work and they're spending an increasing amount of their time writing grants that are not successfully awarded and you know, they're they're really wanting to do great work and are not able to because they're hindered by the the lack of resources uh -huh. uh, so i think that that uh, as well as the state pressure the lack of funding from the state side of things in addition to the federal side they're, they're looking at new ways to innovate, to work with private industry and so forth, but they're really trying to get out there and do better things. As Tom has indicated as well, they're having a harder and harder time attracting students, uh, not only at, at the graduate level and the postgraduate, but trying to get them through the pipeline, attracting them into the pipeline in the K through 12 side of things as well. So it's, it's throughout the whole system that we're hearing the challenges and what we feel, uh, just reading through the report, it, it really addresses much of that need. Uh, the, probably the biggest challenge, though, that we see collectively is how do we make this attractive? How do we sell this to the broad general public and to our, our members of Congress that uh, this is a critical need and we've not made the, the investments and we've got to do so for the future? You know, from my perspective as somebody, as a scientist who's a little further away from agricultural research, um, it's amazing to me how little exposure the rest of the scientific community has to agricultural research questions. Um, one of the things we noted in the report is that there's been over the last couple of decades a phenomenal federal investment in scientific research, in biology, 
in physical sciences, really an explosion in the life sciences, um, a really a truly amazing revolution. And yet, um, uh, if we look at where agricultural research goes on, it is largely separate from other areas of the natural sciences. One of the things we commented on in this report was that in some ways there's an opportunity to, to take advantage of these large federal investments through NIH and through NSF and other areas of science and actually transfer some of that progress into agriculture. Now some of that's happened and Tom, you've been <clears throat> exceptional in, in actually working across fields of agriculture but also into other areas of natural sciences. But there are institutional barriers here and one of the hopes is that we can actually create a more engaged um, agricultural research community that actually has stronger connections to molecular biology, to physics, to chemistry, to engineering. If I can follow up, the big institutional hindrance is no money. If you give money, I guarantee you we'll work with anybody. We're at that stage. Well, we, hope, we think there's really an opportunity maybe with, through, through these uh, uh, institutes or possibly just through competitive grants themselves that this investment will actually reintegrate um, institutionally the, the agricultural sciences community. Does that uh, resonate with, with, with? Absolutely, I think um, if, if the additional funds for both research and, and graduate fellowships were to come to fruition, that would present a very big opportunity. But I, I think as you've pointed out, it does require um, an approach to reintegrating the other sciences, and that means I think that the, the institutions now that play a major role have to perhaps rethink or revisualize um, their relationship to those other sciences and to think about the problems in agriculture as, as system problems, uh, much more complex that require other disciplinary involvement. And I think those um, that kind of outlook is the kind of thing that gets people from other fields excited to see where they fit in, how they fit into solving certain problems. And that's instead of just, say, the agronomy department or the animal science department or something very narrow, um, it's, it's a, a, a more open way of inviting people in to be part of this exciting world of agriculture that those of us in it you know, really know already. What's clear to me is that agriculture has grand challenges and great questions, and so it should be able to attract fabulous scientists from across the disciplines. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So, so, Ellen, just, we don't have much time left. We'll get some questions and answers from the audience in a minute, but any, any last uh, perspective on, on implementation of this report going forward? Uh, implementation. I think getting the word out uh, and what PCAST is able to do, having this report come from PCAST, I think is, certainly is the first step to elevating uh, the issue to a greater degree. It's something that I know on behalf of our societies, each time we're going to the Hill, each time we're going to be communicating with our members of Congress, we're going to have it in hand, we're going to have specific requests based on the report and really try to get it out to that group of people. How we get it out then as well and take it all the way to the general public, get it out to guidance counselors, for example, to, for the K through 12. How do we permeate into the, the general population and talk about these issues, our grand challenges, in a way that uh, invigorates and causes some curiosity about uh -huh. our sciences? Okay, why? Uh, how can we feed this burgeoning population? How are we going to do it sustainably so that we're taking care of our natural resources? Uh, you know, and making those questions stick uh, in the general population, I think that's going to be our biggest challenge in terms of, of garnering support. Yeah. Can, can I add a few words of about course. the implementation? Um, the key of any research activity is, is having sustained funds. and. Uh, while you may not have noticed that there's, there's limited research money out there, and I think the optimism for having more has to be severely dampened. The place where there is money and there is a growing demand for people to participate with them are the private companies. I've had it expressed to me several times, we need people to work with us to do some of these fundamental things. Unfortunately, the companies put most of their money in one basket. A lot of them put it in the biotech and it hasn't really produced much except for the two genes that came out about 20 years ago. So they're in desperate need. They're going to universities now and saying, what can we do? How do we get things going? 
and I think this is one of the things the report has really put forward and, and really probably it helped to institutionalize it into putting together these, uh, these groups involving uh, hopefully some more federal funding and the private funding to bring together uh, public and private people to work together. And that's a little different than the relationship in the past. In the past, the company said, we want you to do this for us. And they would give money to do uh, seed trials or chemical trials. We need a whole new framework where we're working with them a more open atmosphere, a more interactive atmosphere. And I think this is an, an opportunity that we can move forward immediately, no matter what the funding is at the, uh, really at the federal level necessarily. Thank you, Tom. You know, actually, the person who's actually going to help us actually get this done and make this happen is Undersecretary Wateke. So let's actually invite Kathy back up here for a second and, um, and then begin to take some questions from the audience. But I want to start, actually, with asking Sunny Ramaswamy for his perspective, because uh, uh, Sonny is a very important uh, player moving forward in terms of enacting these recommendations through NEFA, um, actually uh, uh, leading this charge. And so, Sonny, you want to you want to stand up for a second and uh, um, give us give us a perspective and maybe okay. a question for anybody up here. All right. You can. All right. Well, thanks very much. To Dan for inviting me to share my perspective and I really want to appreciate you know convey my sense of appreciation as well to to you and Barbara and of course uh, PCAST uh, in general as well uh, for the, uh, the incredible amount of work that you've uh, invested in developing a report a very thoughtful report and you bring gravitas to the situation as it were you know I mean when you think about the agricultural enterprise and it is one of these things that's out of sight, out of mind for most people in America and in the world for that matter, but particularly in this country. And what you've done in, in shedding the spotlight on this endeavor of, uh, this very important endeavor of putting food on the table in the context of the population explosion, in the context of all the other challenges, uh, is, is a very important uh, opportunity for us to move forward. And I thank you very much for doing that. And uh, indeed, you know, as you said, and as Dr. Wateki said as well, I mean, you know, this is 150 years uh, Ago, that uh, scientific agriculture was set into motion. And so for 150 years, that endeavor has had a huge impact in, in America and the world. And I hope this PCAST report is going to have for set the agenda for that, uh, for the food and agricultural enterprise for the next uh, many, many decades to come. And I thank you for that. So already, I think, you know, several of us have taken to heart uh, having had the privilege of interacting with you and, and, and the others on PCAST and having had a chance to read the report as well, we've already incorporated, and, and uh, Dr. Wateki and I and several of my colleagues, we've had some several conversations and uh, about how do we move forward on some of the uh, um, suggestions that you've made, uh, working with the other federal agencies as well as private enterprise. Uh, we're in the process of creating what we call as knowledge partnerships. And the, in going with this innovation ecosystem, these partnerships are very critical to addressing these challenges. And we've already had conversations with a number of the, uh, the uh, um, agencies, federal agencies, as well as some of the uh, folks in private enterprise as well. I'm very optimistic that we're going to make some headway in taking some of the suggestions that you've made and, and moving it forward. Another area that I hope has been part of the, uh, the conversations uh, during the Farm Bill conversations is to create an, an, an enterprise like the Foundation for uh, Agricultural Research, that is to bring private enterprise funding for food and agricultural research like we have for NIH, like we have for FDA and other agencies. And, and I hope as we go forward, people will really think about how can private enterprise come in and invest not just in what's of interest to them, but from that altruistic perspective of societal benefit as well. And maybe there's some opportunities that the PCAST report can help Congress consider moving forward in that area. So I wanted to give that as a sort of a perspective. And I want to ask you a, a question, specifically you, Daniel, Daniel Schrag. Uh, <laughs> as, as Ellen said, uh, we've had a chronic uh, situation of underinvestment in this unbelievable enterprise in this world, uh, in, in America. And the challenges that we address uh, uh, in the endeavors that we support. So that being the case, there's always been a chronic underinvestment. And we've got the report that is now public. And uh, as Ellen said, uh, our community that is watching us uh, across the country will now take this forward, go to Congress, and even within state legislatures to seek the funding that we need. Realistically speaking, from your perspective, and uh, 
tell me what you're thinking. What was the conversation behind the doors, as it were, when you have the ear of the gentleman who has got the ear of the president, and as we go forward, uh, the, the, the reality of realizing what has been uh, recommended by the, in the report. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sonny. And, and I got to say, um, uh, on the first comment you made about the private sector, I think uh, it was amazing to me how the wide variety of, of companies who participated in the various workshops and process that we led um, all said that although you know they weren't willing to fund a lot of the basic research that wasn't going to lead to any product for them in some reasonable time, they would be more than willing to participate in co-funding a set of activities with a group of others, and especially if the, if the federal government were involved. And so these, these private-public partnerships, I think, are incredibly important because I think private sector is willing to do their share, but not necessarily on their own. And I think that's, that's a very important thing. Um, as far as, as the perspective from John Holdren, I'll, I'll just, let me, let me give you this, this observation, which is that um, in general, when we, PCAST, have written now, I think this is, we now have how many reports, Amber? 16, 17 reports, something like that, over the last three years. Um, so it's a very large number of, of activities going on. Um, and I would say that in general, given the current fiscal environment, there has been an extremely strong sense that, uh, that you, one shouldn't ask for new resources. Right? And so, um, as you know, this report asks for substantial new resources. And I can tell you that the leadership of PCAST, both Dr. Holdren and Dr. Lander, didn't blink. This, in this case, the justification is clearly there. Will this happen in the current congressional uh, environment? I, I'm no better at predicting that than you are. You're probably much better than I am, in fact. Um, and you, I know that you will work tirelessly on Capitol Hill to make this happen. And I'll be happy to help you if I can be of help. But I can tell you that in terms of the level of support, um, uh, there was the broad sense that um, asking for new money in this current fiscal environment is an extremely difficult thing. But there was no question among PCAST that the situation in agriculture warranted it that the strategy for how the investment should be made were considered strategic and appropriate, and that hopefully this will be successful. So any other questions from the audience? Please, if you could introduce yourself briefly and then. Um, I'm Con Nugent of the Heinz Center for Science, Economics, and the Environment. Um, I was gratified to see both in the report and in some of the remarks that you just made um, allusions to the ecology of agriculture and the deep embeddedness of environmental issues in agriculture and vice versa, particularly Dr. Bergfeld's remark on, uh, on the need, if you will, to, to uh, address that issue. And I'm wondering if any of the panelists would, uh, would care to go into why is it that perhaps the most environmentally important sector of the American economy is seems to be either separate from or even alienated from this larger, uh, certainly more populous, Tom Sinclair, uh, uh, environmental movement, ecology, this, that, or the other thing. And it's, is there, are there opportunities that you foresee, whether they're uh, fiscally or uh, intellectually uh, driven, uh, for a reconciliation? of the ecological sciences and uh, industrial agriculture. Tom and then Kathy. Well, I'd maybe? like to hear from the panelists, but I also have some thoughts of my own Go ahead, uh, Kathy. on that. I, I think part of what we're suffering from is a lack of realization on the grant, you know, in, in the greater community at how our research agenda has really changed dramatically and this dichotomization of agriculture on one side and environmental concerns on the other, for us doesn't exist. So I would strongly recommend that if you haven't taken a look at our action plan and at the white papers that are informing the directions and the major priorities in our research programs to do so. Uh, because um, it, it really lays out our current thinking, it lays out 
the, the structure of the questions that we're addressing in, in our research programs, and all of them are really focused on this central question of how do we sustainably intensify agricultural production. So, really? so it's agriculture embedded in the larger environment. Do you think that that will attract the, US, the young U.S. citizens that Tom Sinclair was? I, I have to admit, when I'm talking to students, this generation that's in high school and college right now, they're really motivated by that kind of, Great. Kind of question. If, yeah. if you put it in front, in front of them, that's what happens. I get my students, my graduate students, not from applications to study crop science, but from those that have applied to study ecology because their level of background is very much higher than what, uh, embarrassingly so, what our undergraduate in agriculture have. And what I lay out, when I lay out what we're studying, I says, these are what you want to study and it has meaning. It's what people are eating. And uh, I've been very successful. You know, but I think again, um, frankly, uh, uh, it's as much a fault of the environmental science community which I'm a big part of, that we've ignored agriculture yeah. oh, as much as that, I, mean, I think agriculture is actually paying attention to this. It's actually the environmental science culture. But I actually think it yeah. comes back to the institutional structure that we were talking about earlier. If you actually look at where the leading, um, not necessarily environmental science departments, but actually environmental scientists are around the country at institutions, many of those institutions don't have agriculture programs. And that's just the nature of the way, the history of the Murrell Act and the land grant institutions, but many of the leading universities in the natural sciences that have top programs in ecology, top programs in earth science and meteorology and oceanography and, and other areas don't have big agriculture programs. There are some exceptions to that and those play incredibly important roles. Those handful of institutions that are excellent across uh, uh, those areas really are incredibly important. But, but for a large part of the, of the community of environmental scientists that the environmental groups talk to are in places, and, and I'm at one at Harvard, we don't have an agriculture program. The it's terrible, and we need to, we need to fix that. But, but, but again, it's not necessarily that Harvard should start a school of agriculture. The challenge is really to create bridges so that the best environmental scientists at Harvard collaborate with the best agricultural scientists at other institutions. Yeah. Thank you. Other question here, please. Let's wait, wait for the microphone because I think we're, on, uh, we're being recorded. Yeah, Wes Jackson from the Land Institute in uh, Salina, Kansas. Uh, in 2002, uh, Chris Field at uh, Carnegie Institute of Washington and Stanford had a paper in Science in which he, uh, after a survey <coughs> of uh, natural ecosystems, on a global basis uh, concluded that generally natural ecosystems have great, greater net primary production than the human managed systems that follow. Uh, as long as we have what I'll call limited hardware in the form of the annual then we're stuck with something close to clear cutting every year and not giving an opportunity uh, for nature's processes uh, to inform a research agenda. Uh, so part of the reluctance on the part of ecologists to get into agriculture is that they don't have an opportunity to take that knowledge off the shelf that's been available, uh, accumulating for over 100 years. You know, we have the LTER program with 26 sites around the country, well, one's in Puerto Rico, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation for, since 1980. And most of that knowledge sits there, unavailable, uh, to be used in agriculture because of the wrong hardware. Now for some time we've had now I think shown not only the possibility as well as the necessity for building an agriculture based on the perennialized major crops, corn, wheat, sorghum, 
and so on. So this takes long-term commitment to research. And if we could, as a nation, begin uh, to make a commitment to a long-term ecological research effort, then I think we could promise the American people the end of soil erosion, the end of, this is beyond natural replacement levels, be the end of fossil fuel dependency, and a great reduction in the chemical contamination of the land and water uh, by having an agriculture based on the way natural ecosystems work and having the potential of greater net primary production. Now, how hard is that? And what is it that limits our imagination about making that possible to, um, uh, uh, to our legislators or to a PCAST group? Uh, I think that the swarm of young ecologists that's sitting out there vibrating uh, would quickly come in to uh, be a part of that uh, research effort. Wes, thank you very much. And, and uh, let me just broaden your question to, I mean, because PCAST, this, this uh, workshops we discussed actually talked about possibility of perennials um, carrying some of the load in agriculture, but also other things as well. And Tom Sinclair in his discussions brought up a variety of plants that are currently not really used in agriculture, but potentially have have the potential to contribute in the future in ways, especially as the climate is changing in, in, in uh, unusual situations. And I think, again, part of our call for a new investment, both in basic research at NSF and also in uh, more competitive research at USDA, was to create this um, uh, uh, system where, where radical ideas could actually get supported and, su and supported uh, uh, to the point where, where creative new approaches could actually be sustained. But Tom, why don't you comment on that more broadly? Well, uh, I mean, Wes has brought up an, an approach, or many approaches. I mean, Wes, we're using perennial crops all the time in agriculture. Most of it, we let the animals go out and harvest. We don't drag it in. And, uh, but, uh, you know, there's no reason to exclude anything at this point, and, uh, including the annual crops, and I think we need to exploit for the minimum impact on the environment and the maximum return to the farmer. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question over here, please, and then, uh, and then we'll have to wrap up. Hi, Helen Shen. I write science news for nature. Um, and what I wanted to know is um, this November, the California vote on um, GMO food labeling sort of exposed a lot of um, you know, uh, ordinary citizens fears and concerns about um, genetically engineered um, crops. And I was wondering, given that this report talks a lot about um, food safety and nutritious food and also food security, whether there were any specific recommendations or discussions about um, basic research on uh, the health and environmental effects of genetically engineered crops and also communication of those findings to the public? Kathy, do you want to? Uh, uh comment on this because I know you get asked well, about this a lot. Yes, I mean, we, <laughs> we um, uh, within the research program that we're supporting are supporting quite a bit of genetics and genomics research um, in crops as well as in livestock. Um, that research has been enormously important for informing classical breeding approaches, uh, as well as using the new genetic technologies to either do transgenic or cisgenic types of approaches towards development of, 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 of mostly plants that have desirable characteristics. We feel that the, the uh, application of this knowledge can be used across all of the different approaches towards agriculture. Uh, so that it's very important to continue this fundamental research on the genetics of crops and livestock. We also think that the challenge that's ahead of us is so great with respect to sustainable intensification of agriculture, being able to provide all of the services that are being requested out of agriculture at, beyond food, uh, and beyond bioproducts into all of the other ecosystem services as well. 
that we can't turn our backs on any of these approaches. So perennialization is in that basket too. Um, but there's, there, so you know, we're, we're approaching this that we have to have a full portfolio of research for all of the different types of agriculture. So let me just add to what, what Kathy said. You know, um, uh, the big challenge I think here is highlighted is, is partly one of education. Um, uh, the concerns about genetically modified foods, um, I think, comes out of, and this, is, this was um, a perspective I gained from writing the section on, on health and safety of the report. Um, we, it's actually remarkable how incredibly safe our food system is. It was something that we actually were very careful when we were writing the report because um, we had to acknowledge just how remarkable our current systems of protection are at the USDA and, and around the country. When there is a small outbreak of some, and it's very rare, but occasionally it happens, it makes headline news all over the country because it's so rare. I mean, we just expect that we can take food from farms, transport it great distances, sell it in our local store, put it on your table, and you just know it's gonna be safe to eat. That's remarkable. Um, and I think it's, it's an incredible achievement of our entire agricultural system from the farm all the way to the distribution to the table that, that we can actually have safe food and just take it for granted. Um, the concern over genetically modified food, I think much more so in Europe than here, comes from, I think, a lack of awareness and lack of education. And I think the most appropriate avenue is probably to increase um, the public's knowledge about what agricultural research is, what agriculture is. I think people are unaware of actually how agriculture works and what are the achievements and the improvements that have been made over these decades, which have been phenomenal. Our society is sustained by the agricultural developments that occurred in this country over the last few decades. And uh, uh, I, think, I think greater awareness and greater education will go a long way towards that, that um, uh, concern. Okay, any, any other comments, final comments from any of the panel? Kathy, do you wanna say any concluding words? Well, just again, a, a word of thanks to you, uh, to uh, Barbara Shaw and to all the members of the committee and the advisors. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you, Kathy. And let me just say, let me just say again, Barbara Shaw really is the, un, is the hero um, who's not here today and really deserves our, our great thanks and, and appreciation. And ultimately, um, let's, all of us, I hope, can help Kathy Watecki and Sunny Ramaswamy work hard to make this a reality because that's really what we need to do next. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.